John, I just spilled some beer on myself. What better way to start off this <laughs> series? There's <laughs> no better way. <laughs> uh, but thanks for joining me. This is the inaugural uh, edition of Brews yeah. and Biz Dev. And, uh, and our illustrious guest here today is Mr. John. I'm going to say Capel, and I feel like it's, okay, good. I got it yeah, everybody, everybody always says Capel or Copel or everything but Capel. Yeah, yeah, Capel, yeah. I, I, I had the feeling, and I was like, no, that's not how it's spelled. So yeah, it's thank you. It yeah, it's, it's, and, and in, in the land of the Internet, you can see someone's name 100 times and not actually have any idea and have right. conversations with them. And it's like, oh, how do you actually pronounce that? So Exactly, Capel, man. Of InnoSec. So yeah. this is for, uh, oh, and we'll feature the beer before even you do your intro. So John's so choice here. Numero uno, most important. Yes. Hello. Lakeview Lager. So we'll get to the lager in a minute, but why don't you just tell everyone who you are, what you do, the fun yeah. stuff. Awesome. So my journey started, I think, really in life when I moved to, to Buffalo in 2011 for college. So I'm like a small, um, small town village boy in the mountains of New York State. Um, so going away to the university and in 2011 going to UB and the University of Buffalo um, kind of projected it to being a, um, I have bigger dreams than just being a small farmer boy. Um, so I ended up loving it out here. Um, so after college, I, I stupidly moved away to Boston, Massachusetts, because then I was like, well, what's the next big city that I can kind of go and run around for a little bit? Mm -hmm. uh, I missed Buffalo too much. So I came back here, and um, in 2017, we started Intersec, um, which is a very cool 3D printing company. Um, so we do everything from, you know, multi-stage prototyping, so working with inventors and uh, new product developers or large manufacturing companies on basically developing products, custom jigs and stuff, um, but more in the masses. So a lot of where 3D printing is is prototyping, um, but we focus more so on like in the intermediary between there and injection molding. So okay. 5,000 units or so. Um, so we have a lot of printers and we have a little farm here is what we call it. Um, and we're trying to make a good little vibe of cool manufacturing, innovation, and uh, fantasy factory. So got to have, gotta have a little bit of everything, right? Yeah, yes, yes. Certainly in the beginning you do. Uh, maybe one takes off, you know, and then you, you get rid of stuff, but yeah. Those are the things you learn along the way. When we first started Intersec, we had scooters, and we were, like, totally cool with the guys riding scooters around, you know, our two employees plus ourselves. <laughs> and then once it starts getting serious and you realize that that's, like, a big liability and you probably shouldn't do that, um, things change yeah. kind of quickly, but... Yeah. Living you learn. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Growing up as a business, right? <laughs> exactly, right? Growing up with the business while you're trying to grow up yourself. Uh, <laughs> yeah. the sometimes the business is the reason to grow up, and sometimes it forces you back into a hole, and you wish you never grew up at all. <laughs> That's my experience. I don't know. Yeah, don't know. sorry, dude. Sorry you're at that stage. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, not right now. I've just been through that stage a couple of points. And, you know, yeah. every now and again, that stage pops back in for a minute. You know, um, <clears throat> even when we, I think when we love what we do generally, right? I mean, it's it's easy to get caught up in the cliche, the social media, the American, like, yeah, right. you know, I love what you do. You never work a day in your life. Uh, Letter Kenny <laughs> threw that one back out there recently in a way that uh, caught it back on again. Yeah. And uh, I think it's generally true. Uh, but you're, you're not going to do stuff you love the whole time, even if you're doing what you love, right? Something's, sometimes it sucks. Sometimes right. you interact with people you don't want to. Sometimes it doesn't go right. I mean, there's going to be bad days uh, when it's like, what am I doing? And I think, <laughs> I think for me, I think that's a common experience between, uh, I mean, if you're a marketer, you know, like an actual marketer, marketer, or you're a sales yeah. guy, or certainly you're an entrepreneur and you have to be forced into kind of doing all of those things, yeah. right? Ultimately, you've got to, you know, there's going to be really rough days. There's more losses than wins when you stack up, stack them up uh, next to each other. Absolutely. Um, and you got to be able to roll with that, right? I mean, you've got to be able to roll with like, hey, if I'm off 80% of the time, 
that's still 20 and that's pretty good. And we're going to like keep finding that good 20 and we're going to keep you know, doubling down on that. So yeah, absolutely. I think business is a lot yeah, in my experience. I played baseball my whole life. So I think, you know, the real entrepreneurs and then the people that end up, you know, being really successful and, you know, having exits and, you know, whatever we dream of being successful in business, mm -hmm. um, it's a lot like batting averages, you know, you're going to bat, you're going to go to bat a thousand times and you're going to get, you know, if you're lucky, 300 hits out of those right. thousand times, which is three out of a hundred. So, yeah. um, you know, it's a lot of similar. It's throwing a lot of shit at the dartboard until something really sticks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then rolling with what you got for a while. Right, until that stops working, and then you throw right. some stuff up, right? And uh, hopefully you're far enough along. Macro and the micro, you know, there's like the everyday version of that where there's all the little choices and decisions, mm -hmm. and then there's the big stuff. Do I even start this thing, or am I for like salespeople, right, to keep uh, bringing in different? Like, is this what I should be doing for a living? And I, I believe, if unless you're self deluded. Uh, is a question that you often ask yourself if you're in some kind of function of selling and get, you know, mm. as Seth Godin would really put the nice, you know, like getting change to happen. You know, if you're in, if you're in, if you're in the business of having someone else make a change in what they're doing, um, there are going to be some days you're like, yeah, maybe this isn't quite my thing. You know, maybe the, um, uh, the hidden role, you know, the behind the scenes or the something, um, but then you come back and you keep coming back for some reason and you keep coming back and the reasons change, but you keep coming back. So, you know, I think it's the thrill. It's the hunger. Yeah, yeah, there's a the hunger, there's a thrill. Even the losing yeah. a little bit of a thrill sometimes. Even when you're losing, I know, yeah. I get, we're, we're right now kind of starting to train some of our employees into getting into sales. So, you know, and, and like sales, like just developing, you know, getting them comfortable with talking to strangers is like it, you know, and, and like, you know, we don't, we don't sell, we don't push sales on anybody, God forbid, yeah. but um, yeah. it's just about, you know, making an intro and letting people know who you are and that, you know, you could be of service if you will, if, you know, if they have a need. Um, so I'm kind of experiencing that now where, you know, we're doing some of that newer level, um, getting some new feet wet. And, yeah. um, and, you know, we're really, I'm really pushing them to embrace the nose, you know, because for me growing up, I, where I really started in entrepreneurship was I ran a college pro painting franchise in college. Um, so, you know, they taught us the old school way of like going out and, and cold knocking on people's doors, you know, and like training yeah. people to go out and knock on people's doors. And, you know, let me tell you, there's nothing worse than training college students you know, as a college student and having them get rejected a thousand times at a door. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, I feel like there's nothing better than having them say no, get said no to a thousand times. Yeah. Tough skin, man. And yeah, uh, yeah. hopefully some of those guys are doing well. Um, I know, but I think that's really what helped me early is like, you know, you're going to get said no and embrace the no. And there's a million thousand, I don't know, there's a bunch of people in the world just, doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's only a certain number, right? There's only a certain number for whom there's a fit. There's only a certain number we need. It's not right. about everything. But yeah. that's one thing to know that as a concept and a different thing to emotionally deal with it as you go to no after no after no. Right. And uh, yeah, I've done some, I've done some door to door in my day. Um, uh, most notably, I did some, uh, we weren't AT&T, we're like one of those out, outsourced little sales outfits in yeah. Austin, Texas. Yeah. Uh, so if you think it's hot right now here, it ain't. Um, <laughs> compared to Austin, it's just more humid a little bit. But um, I did door-to-door -door, uh, for Uverse, which is like mm -hmm. Verizon has Fios, AT&T has Uverse. It was their, at the time, brand new fiber optic. And, you know, I mean, I got to say, like, even in that gig, besides the fact that it was so insanely hot, and though we were in Austin, which is a, a my kind of vibe, the actual where we went territory wise was always in the suburbs, like outside of Austin. So it was very much just suburban Texas, um, yeah. which is a little less my kind of vibe, naturally, and, <laughs> and a little less vibing with the tattoos I have on my yeah. arms, right? So we were a very, very conservative type. I'm not familiar with the area. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's like a, one in particular is an area called Cedar Rock, Texas. And it's kind of like, I mean, Austin itself is like this weird little 
kind of hippie-ish because it's a college town, right? It's the yeah. capital, but it's a college town. It's so awesome. It's so fun. Live music capital of the world. But it's it's un-Texas. You know, there's not everything else in Texas is, you know, the cliches, right? The the big belt buckles and the whatever and Houston <laughs> and the Dallas Cowboys and the rest yeah. of the and I'm, I'm, you know, uh, that's fine. But tattoo wise, when we got a job and it was in Austin, we had territory in the city. Yeah. I was better suited than most people because I, and I would, I would like roll up sleeves so that people could see right. the tattoos because it's that kind of place. Mm-hmm. In Cedar Rock, they're like, no, we're not having it. So I would have long sleeves on. And I, you know, I shit you not, I'm walking up the doors and they have those fun old school thermometers, you know, on the outside. (laughs) The mercury thermometers. Yeah. So I can see as I was walking up, it's like 120 and I'm, you know, I'm full on Richard Nixon sweating just through everything. I'm kind of a sweaty, I'm a big, I'm a fat guy. Let's just call it. Yeah, that's what's here, man. Yeah. It's like a, it's like a, and so I've sweated through these clothes, but I dare not, you know, like raise my sleeves up or anything. (laughs) It was, it was a nightmare. I That's crazy. Plenty of days that I was like, what am I doing out here? Uh, usually I was thinking that in my car at that point with the AC going. <laughs> um, but, uh, and that was, you know, a fairly easy sale. That's walking around, you know, asking people if they would rather not have Time Warner. And the answer right. is yes, right? If, yeah. if they trust you at all, the answer is yes. Like we have an option and it's mm-hmm. better. But being the large sweaty guy, I'm pretty big for a doorway. You know, I'm kind of like a looming, you know, um, sweating. It was a little harder. It was a little, a little harder uh, out in those days. But yeah, every day there was a little bit of a, oh, I don't know. I don't know if this is it, you know. Um, and of course, then there's the skeezy stuff. There's all the other stuff where the other salesmen are lying. They're pulling the normal door to door tricks. Uh, then, then some, you know, making up stuff and getting orders canceled. And, you know, I did my best, like, I'm going to not do any of that, right? I'm not going to tell a lie or a fabricate, you know, I'm going to see if, is this, a, is it possible to be a salesperson at that level? Not B2B where everyone knows, right. everything, but like door to door, cold salesperson, um, without actually stretching anything, can you convert? My experience a lot of times was no. Um, yeah. And I found that the people that I respected the most and we would agree on things, I'd go out and I'd shadow and then I'd hear it would always be somewhere and every, like there's always something come in and I'm like, oh, that's not true. I mean, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't blow up his pitch, mm-hmm. but I'm like, oh no, like even this dude, <clears throat> like everyone who's killing it out here is like bullshit. A little bit. Yeah. And, yeah. and that was actually the thing that eventually took me out of that kind of sales mm-hmm. because I literally couldn't find, I mean, maybe if someone would have been telling the truth and getting good numbers, that would have been something, but it was not the case. I shadowed everyone. They all lied. And I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I guess this be, is why uh, well people have a bad rep. That's why I think we're seeing that style die out so quickly because it's either like, you know, you – you get the immediate success, you know, you get the sale, but on the back end, you know, you get the, you lose that recurring revenue. And I think companies are starting to realize that it's that recurring revenue and the, the you know, being true to your brand and your customers that's going to, you know, make them last a hundred years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They get into it and, and they bail as soon as their three month discount, you know, or something goes away, right? They, they just gone. That's not a good look. Uh, if, if people come out, if they were Time Warner customers, and then they come out thinking worse of your company than they did of Time Warner, like, you've done something wrong. Yeah. Um, that, you know, uh, it's a historically bad company, customer service-wise. So it's like, yeah. So even the easiest looking things for me, and I think we're in green, agreement on this, like, you got to be able to tell the truth and still get the job done. Otherwise, at least for me personally, like I don't, I don't ever do it. I can't, I can't pull it off. Like there's only so much bullshitting that I can handle, and I usually I reserve that for bullshitting myself. <laughs> <laughs> high, high morals. That stuff goes, you know, it goes a long way. I think when it comes to you know brand building and stuff. It's um, yeah. with some of these larger companies, we don't even know what really goes on. So who knows? You know, yeah. it could be either or. Yeah, uh, I see that early, like, you know, with, with Intersec and even back when I ran College Pro, it was like, even for myself, it was transparency. I realized that, you know, 
I can try to convert every single person, even if they don't, you know, their house is painted perfectly. And maybe, you know, the only way to really sell them is to say, well, you know, you should change the color because everybody on your street has a better color than you. Um, <laughs> is even though, you know, it, it may work, if you have a way more con higher conversion rate and success rate, if you're going to people who have, you know, bad paint jobs, like where their house is, you know, their paint is chipping off on their lawn, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, or, you know, that they actually have a need for what you're providing and then, <laughs> you know, let them, let them be the determining factor if you're the one that, you know, they want to do the job or not. Mm -hmm. uh, so, no. you know, I think we, we established that with Intersec is that transparency is key no matter what. And it's like, if we can't do the job, then we've been trying to just create a network of people here and locally and, you know, nationally that we can just give good recommendations to. Yeah. Because, I mean, yeah. I know when we were building the business, the recommend the good recommendations are, you know, would end up taking you the next step further because somebody recommends something that you never knew of before. Yeah. And you try it and it ends up being, you know, one of the best investments you could have made at the time. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's good. I wish, I wish I could get that for a CRM system, though. I'm still, you know, I played, I've, I've been using HubSpot a little bit, but I've been, I'm still not satisfied 100% with what we're trying to do yet. Ah, uh, uh. and yeah, you, and you're not probably not, not you're not big enough for Salesforce to even come close to making sense. I don't want to think about. It. We just had to spend, I think, our biggest yearly expense for a software on um, a design software, so 3D design. Yeah. We just had to renew it, you know. We just had our first year, which is like you know super cheap, and now we had to renew it for the next three years, and mm -hmm. significant. Yeah. So now we got to make sure we get super value out of that and figure out how many jobs we're going to have to do to pay for that. Right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. How to make it worthwhile. Keep, keep track of those metrics. Yes. Yeah. Oh, you know what? As I'm looking at this can and you're drinking. So <clears throat> you're given, you're given the, uh, the, the choice of what brew you wanted to come on Brews and BizDev with, and you picked the Hamburg Brewing Company at Lakeview Lager. So the only question is why? Our first Intersec facility, when we were first getting off the ground, was down near Hamburg Brewery. It's actually right up the street. Okay. And, and in college, and in college, um, I went on a beer tour there, and it was actually one of the first beers that I've ever had. Oh. And I, and I had it with one of my buddies, um, and we just drank it in our fraternity house um, living room after coming back from the beer tour, and was like, "This is the life." Nice. <laughs> <laughs> very, it's a very like back porchy beer, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and coming from Catskill and being uh, like an outdoorsy town, I think everything just kind of fit for it. Yeah. It's a good uh, thinking, thinking and drinking beer. <laughs> it's good. It's good. I like to pretend that Hayburner is, but after a while, that thinking part goes a little sideways. <laughs> but um. He's the light. Yeah. This is good. Yeah, this is, yeah, what is it, 5.2 alcohol, ABV, so. Close your eyes and take a sip. It's like you're, like, in the trees by the by the, the lake, you know, fishing. I don't know if you're okay. a fisher. You do a little fishing. Um, and some of the best, some of the best uh, times in life yeah. come from, you know, being with people and being outside. And yeah. It was perfect. Yeah. No, that is. That's a good lager. I don't, um. You know, beer wise, as do like billions of people at this point, because it's like the trendiest thing ever. But, um, you know, largely IPAs, there's always something worth getting into in there. Um, for me personally, <laughs> I'm going to, I highlight this beer every time. I brought a backup just in case this took any more than 10 minutes, right? I was like, there's a koozie. Oh, there's a Vidwheel koozie. Look at that. Oh, uh, product placement. But yeah, yeah, yeah. A double, double up there. But yeah, the Hayburner has been my go to. Just for everything, even like even my wife drinks it now. My wife Megan uh, has has a couple as we work our way through this pandemic summer. And um, and uh, <laughs> but sometimes it it can be a bit much because <clears throat> it is yeah. it's two or three points. It's like a seven two or something. And so while it's very crushable, as they say, um, and potent, which is why a big guy like me appreciates it because I can feel it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> You can't you can't stack them on top of each other like you can like a certain mm -hmm. lager in the summertime, right? If you, right. you get you get a twelve pack in, if you're twelve in with hay burners, 
even if you've got a 24 hour period, you're probably in pretty rough shape, right? So, um, but you know, loggers, you can crush a, uh, crush a few and it's fine. And the ABV is down there and they're, they're, they're a little, little bit lighter. And yeah, this is good. I've never, I've never had this one before. Ben, yeah, I agree. Like loggers, um, you know, there's some, there's some nights, maybe you know, one or two nights a week where me and the partners will be here. You know, we'll come back eight, nine o'clock at night. Mm-hmm. Have to pound a couple beers and then put on our thinking caps and then yeah. do, do a little meeting. Yeah. I feel like yes. it's in That's secrets to business, you know? Yeah. Uh, and beer is definitely one of them. Everybody appreciates getting a beer, getting bought a beer, given a beer. Yes. Yeah, I got a lot of uh, notes in the last few um, days. Well, it's my birthday. And so there's a lot of that kind of. Uh, like, oh, wish I could buy you a beer kind of stuff, right? Because, you know, because our current circumstances, it's not really a thing. Um, I did tell a few people, like, you can still, you can send me one. It's fine. You know? <laughs> they all do delivery now, right? It's like, yeah, come on. It's fine. Um, nobody bought. Nobody, nobody bought on that one. But, yeah, you can, you can tie it in, right? There's a, there's a lot of business connections. Obviously, there's also the old, that old school business, that mad men kind of a thing, right? Whereas, but particularly in the marketing and like the biz dev side of things, yeah. where it's almost beer and harder, much harder things are, are like entrenched in the culture of it. Mm-hmm. And you can't quite get away with that level of stuff these days. But being in a, in a city like Buffalo, where there's always going to be plenty of beer flowing around and having like these micro breweries and these smaller places open up and not just open, but like be good. It's yeah. one thing to have people producing beer and it's like, all right, good job. High five. It's nice that you exist, but I don't like what you're putting out, you know? Um, but, yeah. you know, having like something that's as kind of all purpose as a hay burner come out of like the local area and then if you're going to go a lager, like, okay, here's something else, right? Or if you're looking for some kind of stout or something heavy, like there are people who do that better than the others. Like, I think that's a cool thing. I think it's cool economically and culturally. I agree. I'm, I'm real fascinated in, you know, I think bars in general, because things are going to get a little bit interesting. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've always been a fan, you know, there was before – all of this, you know, there's there's so many microbrews coming up, and I'm really always been really big into like differentiation, you know, like how how do you differentiate your whatever from everybody else's whatever? Yeah. Uh, and I love this idea of themed brews, like three themed bars. Mm-hmm. So you know, like having something, it's really big over, it's really big overseas, where it'll be, you know, in, in like Asia and Japan, and Korea, where they'll have, you know, these this bar that's you know in in a jail cell or something like that okay and i think it's all about the experience you know yeah. so i would have loved to put together some type of um like maybe like a wall street a wall street bar where the where the beer prices like you know go based on just all oh, right <laughs> um you know like that would be a good one um yeah. but i don't know maybe not anymore <laughs> it's yeah not, and they started getting a different, thinking a different way. Yeah, you might put that in a pile for something way later, uh, maybe if something changes back to normal. Right. And yeah. awfully, an even worse idea, as you were saying, I was thinking like, oh, like a theme. Like, well, what about those uh, those escape rooms? You know, could you mix together where you're like, here's your beer. To get the next one, you got to get out of here. I feel like probably no, the liabilities and, and accident proneness of that. I mean, there's. There's already been enough like horrible things that have kind of happened in those in those. Yeah. Places. yeah. You know, um, like yeah, I don't, I don't think the insurance will work out. Yeah, I don't. I don't think so. I asked some my, some of my buddies about that. <laughs> like I don't know. You think those rage rooms? You see all about the rage rooms right yeah. now. Like I don't know. I wonder if the insurance is to start one of those. You know. Yeah, pretty high. But I mean, what better place for alcohol than a rage room? I mean, some. It's made to go hand in hand. Exactly. Oh. I'm a fan. I'm a, I'm pro. I'm pro rage room. If I get the opportunity, I would love to try one. Yes. Not like I'm full of rage, but like when else do you get the opportunity to just like destroy something? Yeah, in a in a very controlled way that doesn't hurt anyone else or yourself or like yeah, I think it's a good thing. I think it's uh, a good thing. Um, yeah, peaceful way. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right, so. To wrap up this rambling convo, uh, what is BizDev and Brews? 
So what do you think is your favorite thing that's ever happened, like it, it, whether it was impactful for you or, I mean, you talked about the cracking these, these brews when you got back from the tour, but an actual business and brews, right? So something where these two came together for you. Tell me something. I think – I think it came back to that that ex- the experience in college of of being in the fraternity and being in a business fraternity where um, one of one of the alumni immediately got a job at North American Brewery and was hooking up the fraternity with you know beer all the time um, and that's also right around the same time that I got really entrepreneurial and I was running the business and you know nothing's better than a fresh brew when you when you get home from a long day of work yeah yeah. So, and then it helps with the thinking. So, you know, I think lots of business ideas, future businesses of mine, um, mm-hmm. all stem out of one golden carbonated beverage. Nice, nice. And often, that's Hamburg. Often Hamburg. Yes. When it's, <laughs> when it's time for me to do some thinking, Hamburg. I need a few lager. I like it. Nice, nice. Well, thanks, bud. Thanks for coming out for this, uh, sharing a little bit of story little bit of wisdom uh turning me on to a solid you know good good beer i always appreciate that kind of a nod and uh yeah i think we'll be seeing a lot more in a sec in the uh in the in the upcoming days wow bam that's dramatic you should uh if i was a better editor yeah we'd open with that as as the clip uh and then jump back right into it uh i wish i knew video editors right if only i knew people like that (laughs) <laughs> I can refer you. Yeah, yeah, cool, cool. Refer me to myself. Um, cool. Thanks for coming out uh, and rambling through this inaugural edition with me. And I have no doubt we'll be hearing great things from you soon. For sure, man. Thanks so much. All right, thank you. All right, have a good one, John. See ya.